Hello everyone, welcome to video 10-2. In this video we're going to be looking at how the skeleton and muscles work to help move the body and maintain homeostasis. And in this particular image we see a uh, portrait of a person drawn 500 years ago. And already at that time people began to understand that one of the main functions of the skeleton is to provide support and movement. But we're going to go beyond that and look at other functions of the skeleton. Here we're looking at a depiction of bone shown close up. So you can see closely here there's a, uh, a long bone such as a femur or humerus and in that bone we can see there's uh, actual little concentric circles in here and there's tiny little dots and here's a picture of that close up. Uh, what we find in here are these are actually these tiny little uh, dark spaces in here you see are where there's actual cells and so your bone is actually made of living cells and the bone can grow and change as those cells uh, use nutrients which are provided by these blood vessels here. So let's look at so those major functions, those six major functions of the skeleton. So as we saw before, support of course is uh, your backbone and your legs and so forth are supporting the body helping you def uh, defy gravity. Also protection, so your skull and your rib cage for example protect the organs like your brain, your heart, your lungs. Assisting in movement. So uh, if there's muscles attached to bone, which there are, that allows your, the body to move around. Making blood. Okay, so this is something that's not as obvious. We're going to see this more closely in the next picture. But um, at the end of the bone, there's a type of marrow called red marrow, and that's where uh, red blood cells are made. So we'll explore that coming up. Storing minerals. So the bone is made out of calcium, and that is a type of mineral that actually makes the bon bone, uh, bone strong. And the calcium can be used uh, for uh, muscle contraction and things like that um, also in the body. Uh, and finally, storing fat. So in the long cavity here, there's this area where uh, fat is stored for uh, the a person that might be starving. Uh, and that is another uh, function of the bone. So here we can see a close-up now where that red marrow is found in this area called spongy bones. So red blood cells and white blood cells, they're, they're actually made uh, from these adult stem cells that are the end of the bones, and that spongy bone there. And then there's this long central cavity which is formed of another type of marrow called yellow marrow, which is primarily fat. And that can be used uh, for energy by an organism if they're, uh, if a, uh, a mammal or some other kind of uh, creature that has fat in those long bones is starting to uh, maybe starve. And so animals like hyena can actually crack open those bones and eat the marrow and dogs and other carnivores often try to get at it but their jaws may not be strong enough to actually access that marrow. Alright, so let's look at the types of cells that actually make the bone alive like we were indicating uh, earlier there. So uh, here we see there are these osteocytes. Osteocytes are but, uh, cells that actually um, are alive, they're using nutrients, uh, glucose and oxygen, and they help maintain the actual functioning of the bone. And um, there are bone building cells called osteoblasts. So over your lifetime, bones are growing uh, and getting bigger, and osteoblasts would help to do that. But there's also osteoclasts, and so bones also need to be rearranged as the body responds to changes and stresses for example, as you lift weights, there's more stress that needs to be created, and the bone will actually rearrange itself, break down, and then rebuild. And osteoclasts help to break that bone down, and osteoblasts will rebuild that. Uh, or imagine you were to break a bone, osteoclasts will break down the damage, and the osteoblasts will repair that. So both the two together um, help maintain that normal functioning or homeostasis of the bone. Now we're going to start to explore how muscles are attached to bone. So here's a picture showing the Achilles tendon. And you can see that there's this type of tissue called connective tissue that's going to connect the back part of your foot, okay, called the heel, which is a calcaneus bone, to the uh, lower part of the leg there where there's also bone. And so this Achilles tendon is going to attach this muscle, this soleus calf muscle, to that bone. And that's the function of a tendon is to attach uh, this muscle here, the soleus, to the bone down here of the calcaneus heel. Another uh, type of connective tissue uh, is known as ligaments. Ligaments attach bone to bone. So here we're looking at the back of the uh, foot, this particular bone here, and that's being attached to another bone in the foot, and that's the job of ligaments. 
Now, earlier, a moment ago, we saw how bone can repair itself. Like if you broke a bone, osteoclast and osteoblast will help rebuild that bone. And that's because a bone is filled with blood vessels. Through those little tubes or um, haversion canals. There's all kinds of blood vessels delivering oxygen and glucose to those living bone cells. Whereas tendons and ligaments have very little blood flow. And so if you tear a ligament or a tendon, it, it's going to be very hard for that to be repaired. And so often that requires surgery. Uh, where the uh, ligaments might be have to be stitched together literally or the same thing with a tendon. Alright, now we're going to focus on muscles. So um, muscles are made of these multinucleated cells here. And so uh, a muscle cell is different from a typical, let's say a cheek cell that you may have looked at in the microscope earlier this year, where these muscles are instead of being kind of globular and circular, they're long and cylindrical. And they are also multinucleated, which is unusual for a cell to have many nuclei in them. And reason, the reason why that is is because muscles can respond quickly to forces, such as uh, a person that might be needing to use um, their muscles and, and their uh, arms and legs a lot by lifting things. And if that happens repeatedly, day after day after day, the body responds by adding more protein to the muscle. And of course, of course proteins are coded by DNA, and the more nuclei you have in that cell, the more DNA you have and the more protein you can make. And you can respond to uh, that force of, of uh, pulling and, and so forth where the uh, muscle has to have more protein and therefore the muscle gets bigger. So that muscle cell is made of these cables, these cable-like structures called myofibrils. And a myofibril, shown here now, Okay, there's this myofibril. You can see that there's these dark areas and light areas on opposite sides. The darker areas are uh, produced by a type of um, protein called myosin. As we're going to see, myosin is dependent on ATP to work. And then flanking the um, myosin are these proteins here called actin. Not like our town, but spelled with an I. Actin on this side and actin over here. And that's a thinner, uh, lighter colored um, protein. And now let's explore how actin and myosin work to cause movement. So what happens is ATP will bind to the myosin. So the myosin has these little head-like structures, these filaments that kind of stick out. And as ATP binds to that myosin head, it causes the myosin to bind to the actin. And that's sometimes called a cross bridge when that happens. When that cross bridge is formed, the phosphate is displaced or breaks off from the ATP, and that is, leaves us with ADP. Um, but without that phosphate there anymore, the myosin head is now going to change shape. So instead of being in this position with the phosphate gone, it's going to bend like that. And what that does is it causes the myosin to pull the actin in this direction. So the uh, actin is being pulled in that direction as the myosin bends. Um, once that force is created, ADP will break off. You can see the ATP, ADP is no longer on the myosin. Um, and so the myosin head will pull away from the actin, like that, and we can restart this whole process again if more ATP is used. And then the process just keeps continuing. So let's look at another view of that. So uh, let's say we have a relaxed sarcomere. That's what this whole structure is called. The darker parts here are the myosin, shown in red, and then the blue over here, we have these blue filaments, that's the actin. So if ATP is used, these little dots on here, those are the myosin heads, are going to cause those to pull the actin together. And so overall, the sarcomere is contracted together like that. Here's an animation that shows this. And so if ATP is used, the overall tension or contraction of the sarcomere happens. And here we have two sarcomeres right over here on the left and on the right. And as ATP or energy is used by the body, the sarcomeres contract. So the takeaway message here is ATP causes a sarcomere to contract, therefore producing a pulling force on a muscle. So muscles can only work by pulling together since the sarcomere itself works by contraction. And in our last slide, we're going to look at how muscles work together to create a range of motion. So here we're looking at a person's body, and we're going to look at this central uh, axis of the body. So right down the skull, right through the spine, all the way down. So we'll call that the central axis of the body. Okay. 
So imagine you were to lift your arm away from that central shaft or that central point of the body. So by taking your arm away from that central uh, line of the body, you are abducting your arm. Think of abduction as like being uh, taken away, like abducted by aliens kind of idea. Abduction means to be removed, in this case from the central line of the body. If you were to move your arm toward that central line along here, you are adding it to that central axis and therefore you're adducting it. So therefore abduction is to move the limb away from that midline of the body, that central axis, whereas adduction is to move it toward that midline. And finally, last idea we're going to look at is how muscles can work together to create a range of motion. So in your arm, for example, you have your biceps and your triceps. So if you contract the biceps, that's going to cause your arm to be pulled inward. We call that flexion. Or if you were to contract your triceps, that's going to cause the arm to be extended. And the overall idea is that skeletal muscles work in opposing pairs to create a range of motion. And that can create uh, homeostasis or normal functioning of the body. So together, both the skeleton and the muscles help create those range of motions, which we're going to be exploring soon as we dissect a chicken wing, and we're going to be exploring that more in class. So thanks for watching, and I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the video.